Let me give, begin by thanking uh, Stephanie and Trisha Rose for inviting me to serve as moderator for this event. Um, I'm really thrilled to join you all in talking with Professor Bailey about her provocative work. Um, and before giving the formal introduction, I just wanna provide a few additional details about the format of the hour. Uh, after my remarks, Professor Bailey will present for about 20 to 30 minutes. Following that, we'll have a, about 25 to 30 minutes for the Q&A. And again, just uh, to re reiterate what Stephanie said, please use the raise hand function to signal that you have a question and I'll call on you accordingly. Professor Moya Bailey has established herself as a formidable scholar and engaged public intellectual. She has published widely in academic journals, including Gender and Society, Women's Studies Journal, Souls, and Feminist Formations. Her research has earned her postdoctoral fellowships with the Michigan State University Building Healthcare Collective and the Penn State University Africana Research Center. Alongside this exceptional scholarly record, she has also maintained a highly visible presence as a commentator on television and radio programs across the nation. These impressive accomplishments duly recognized, I'm especially keen to participate in today's discussion of Professor Bailey's new book, Misogynoir Transformed. This work is striking in part because of the judicious way that she acknowledges a debt to an established tradition of black feminist theory and yet pushes back forcefully against key bulwarks of that intellectual legacy. Professor Bailey aptly reckons with the critique of black female stereotypes advanced by pioneering feminist scholars like Barbara Christian and Hazel Carby. Yet at the same time, she fruitfully troubles conceptions of womanhood, respectability, and wholeness that have, that have designated the political subject and object of black feminist inquiry in overly restrictive terms. Her subsequent call for a more expansion, expansive vision of Black feminism is a welcome and exciting renovation. So without further delay then, it's my pleasure to welcome Moya Bailey. Thank you so much, Roland. That was such a wonderful introduction. And uh, for me, it's such a pleasure to hear how other people understand uh, the work and what I'm doing. And uh, one, I'm so excited that so many people from different parts of my life are here. Uh, mm -hmm. Shout out to Jesse Loon, who's coming, I mean, like Fayetteville, my hometown. I'm just mm -hmm. thrilled uh, <laughs> to have all of these different folks represented here. And to begin, I always like to start with an acknowledgement of where I am currently. And I am currently on Massachusetts Wampanoag land, uh, the traditional territory of the Wampanoag Massachusetts Pawtucket people. And as such, you know, we are doing this work of addressing uh, the internet, at least in the context of my book, but that can give us a sense of disembodiment and not really a, connected, a connection to the place where we are. So I also invite you, if you know um, where you are, the traditional stewards of the land where you are, feel free to put those in the chat so that we can always remember, again, uh, who made our connection today possible and who is actually uh, giving us the possibility to connect online through the very physical embodied land on which we rest and are able to talk with one another. So to begin, I'm gonna be reading a bit uh, from the book's preface and introduction. I wanted to give you all a little taste of how the book is coming together and what I hope to accomplish through uh, the book and hopefully give you an opportunity to develop some interest in the book as well. I love that this is being recorded because something I, I said today that is more true to me now is if you are a grad student or somebody who might have the opportunity to need 
to know the contents of a book. A book talk is a great way to learn about uh, the contents of a book without having to read the whole thing because the author is going to do the work of trying to give you the, the highlights and the parts that are most important to them. And of course, uh, the parts that are most important to me are the beginning and perhaps the origin story of the text. So without further ado, I'm going to start with the preface. Although I did not know it at the time, I started writing this book as an undergraduate at Spelman College. I was on the road to becoming a medical doctor when two things happened that made me shift course. I fell in love with women's studies and I got international attention as one of the leaders of a small pushback on campus against the rapper Nelly. Both events profoundly shaped my thinking about the way Black women are treated in society and moved me to coin the term misogynoir, which in turn led to this book. As a first year student from tiny Fayetteville, Arkansas, I was appalled when Dr. Beverly Geisheftal told the Spelman College entering class of 2005 about Sarah Bartman's experiences as a human exhibit in Europe during the early 19th century. Bartman, a young Khoisan woman from what we now recognize as South Africa, was displayed throughout Europe to paying white audiences as an example of the animalistic and inferior nature of the African woman. Implicit in Bartman's display was a comparison between her body and that of the white women who viewed her. European scientists equated Bartman's anatomical differences with sexual deviance, drawing conclusions about her sexuality and subsequently the sexuality of black women from her form. Her butt and genitalia were used to justify racist and sexualized violence as well as the continued enslavement of Africans in the quote unquote new world. Dr. Guy Sheftal explained the exploitative ways Bartman's body was treated in life and in death and that it was made possible under the guise of objective science. Though what Bartman actually endured was objectification through scientific racism and sexism. In my first week at Spelman, before I had even entered the classroom. Dr. Guy Sheftal had challenged my thinking by describing the differential treatment Black women experienced on a global stage. After that moment, I knew I wanted to take every class I could with her. I was awakened to the profundity of the unique nexus of experience that is Black and woman on this planet and throughout colonial history. Along with enrolling in Dr. Guy Sheftal's classes, I took classes with fellow feminist professor, Dr. M. Bahati Kaumba, or as we like to call her, Dr. K, who gave me the final nudge into the open arms of the comparative women's studies major at Spelman. As I was matriculating, I also got involved in the feminist political organizations on campus, all of which were supported by the Women's Research and Research Center, the home of the comparative women's studies department. It was Dr. K who asked, you're taking all the classes, why not be a major? And when she put it that way, there was no room for rebuttal. But in truth, I was a willing convert despite still having every intention of attending medical school, though that was not to be. As a 19 year old junior and then president of the Feminist Majority Leadership Alliance, I showed the group Nellie's music video for the song Tip Drill which had started airing on the late night television show, Uncut on BET. The video featured most memorably a scene where Nellie slides a credit card down the crack of a black woman's butt. Our group decided to name him our misogynist of the month. Not knowing the Spelman Student Government Association had agreed to partner with Nellie and his foundation, Just Us for Jackie, to hold a bone marrow registration drive on our campus in an effort to save the life of his sister who had leukemia. FMLA raised questions about the misogynoir in videos and lyrics, and when we heard that Nelly was invited to campus, it seemed only fair that we ask him about the way he represented Black women since he was asking us for our help. 
Nelly declined our offer to talk about his music. Instead, he went to the press, twisting the story such that it seemed that Spellman canceled the bone marrow registration drive because of the video, an assertion that many people still believe today, though we orchestrated our own drive. The story garnered national and eventually international headlines, both praising and condemning Spellman students for their daring to talk back to the music. And this was a really hard lesson for me at the time. Uh, this was my first experience with death threats. And we can imagine back in this time, this is, you know, 2004, 2005. So this is not social media death threats. These are death threats that are like being sent to my Spellman mailbox, um, my campus email address, which also isn't public. So then there's a question of how do people have access to that? Uh, Nellie felt entitled to our assistance with saving his sister's life, but, not, but did not feel that he had to address us, the Black women who dealt with the fallout of his video and lyrics in our day-to-day -day lives. As young Black women, we felt the impact of the video and lyrics in the form of street harassment in the United States and abroad. We dealt with assumptions about our sexual availability to men in the form of unsolicited commentary on our bodies, on our clothing, and on our time. Nelly used his celebrity built on the bodies of Black women to urge people to support an underappreciated cause, the health of Black women. Black women are far less likely to find a matching bone marrow donor than their white woman counterparts, in part because of Black people's deep distrust of systemic racism in medicine, which makes them less likely to volunteer to donate. What was not quite clear to me in 2004 was the irony of using a fame garnered through limiting representations of Black women while refusing to address that decision and also wanting support from those very same women. I wasn't quite able to connect the dots between popular media representations of Black women and my and other Black women's experiences with discriminatory housing practices, intimate partner violence, street harassment, employment discrimination, and ill treatment from healthcare providers. But my interest in the role media plays in shaping the perceptions of Black women became all-consuming, such that the goal of becoming a medical doctor morphed into getting a doctorate to investigate the role that media representations play in the treatment of Black women patients by white doctors. I learned about the ways historical popular culture seeped into the consciousness of supposedly objective future physicians, which prompted me to consider how popular cultural representations influence Black women's treatment in society and medicine today. It was in writing that dissertation that I landed on the word misogynoir to describe the particular venom directed at Black women through negative representations in media. How do you describe the ways that Black women are uniquely denigrated because of their gender and race? I played with a couple of terms before landing on misogynoir. And initially the term existed only in my dissertation until 2008 when I was invited to join the Crunk Feminist Collective, an online blogging community of feminists of color. From 2008 to 2013, the CFC dominated the Think Peace blogosphere with insightful and pithy commentary on popular culture, primarily through the lens of hip hop feminism. At its height, the CFC blog was home to 14 black and feminist of color bloggers who wrote about the news of the day, paying special attention to highlight the intersections of race and gender in their writings. The CFC bridged a seemingly contradictory love for crunk hip hop music that dominated the radio airwaves in the aughts and the feminist theory we were learning in graduate school. The blog was a place for timely and incisive criticism and my first po post, they aren't talking about me, discussed my concern about my own apathetic response to misogynoir and music. It was the word's first appearance outside the diss. And once I used it, other members of the collective started to use the term 
and it appeared in more post. From there, some members of the blogosphere began to use it, but no one more compellingly than womanist blogger Trudy at her now sunsetted Radiant Lair. Her work introduced online communities to the word and she deftly articulated its utility. Her work and others helped the term reach a wide range of audiences, including an international one. When I coined the term, I did not expect it to go viral. In addition to appearing in the New York Times, Ebony Essence and the Washington Post, Misogynoir has its own Wikipedia entry, which receives thousands of views every day. I also learned recently that it was on an episode of uh, Charmed, and it was also mentioned on The Daily Show, which is of uh, interest to my mother who loves, loves, loves Trevor Noah. <laughs> uh, the ad adoption of the term and its wide reach in digital space make further theorization of its use important for gender, critical race, and cultural studies audiences outside the academy. And I really hope, and I hope Roland can let me know also if this work uh, really extends beyond the academy in terms of its use. Uh, I think that the book, you know, is is a tenure book, but I hope, and I have heard some tale that it has some utility beyond beyond the academy. And uh, that is the preface. And I want to skip and talk specifically about who I mean when I say Black women, because I do think that there are a lot of assumptions about who Black women are and what we mean when we say that. And so I also had the wonderful experience of having uh, a graduate student uh, read the book and live tweet it. And in that process of live tweeting it, pointed out a lot of the ways that the work is challenging the uh, cis and heteronormative assumptions about who Black women are. And that is definitely a, a big part of my intention with this text is to get people to think beyond that assumption of who Black women are that for most people assumes that Black women are cis and heterosexual. So uh, this is in the introduction in a section that is called um, Black Women Does Not Equal Black Feminists. I struggled to come up with language that fully captured who is engaging with this transformation of misogynoir. The term Black women is often assumed to mean straight and cis, with queer and trans Black women identified explicitly because of this normative assumption. Additionally, the term Black women is not inclusive of non-binary, agender, and gender variant Black folks whose experiences of misogynoir are intimately connected with a misgendering of them. I struggled to reconcile my use of a term that is central to my definition of misogynoir, yet excludes some of the people most invested in its transformation. For those of us on the margins of black womanhood, woman is not what we name ourselves, even as misogynoir colors our experiences in the world. As you will see in this text, it is often those of us in the shadows of black women who are the most engaged in media projects that transform misogynoir as we in the shadows are already limited by the frame of black womanhood, we become some of misogynoir's most vociferous opponents because it further diminishes our already limited light. When a hetero and cis normative understanding of black women is used, it obscures the realities of those of us in the shade. I experimented with terms to describe those of us on the margins of the margins of Black womanhood before landing on misogynoir. Digital spaces are rife with words, phrases, and terms that attempt somewhat, sometimes awkwardly, to address the slippage between women and all who aren't cis men. One of those terms is non-men, which centers men as it attempts to define those of us who are not. 
non-men is used online as a catch-all term, but its use recreates the exact erasure it wants to undo. Women with an X, sometimes a useful interlocutor when it's with its roots in pre-colonial indigenous languages and contemporary decolonial lingual practices. The X in women intervenes in the racist colonial histories of English and Spanish, while also attempting to solve the problem of genders beyond the man-woman binary. That is a lot of work for one letter to accomplish. However, even as women with an X, by definition includes gender, non-binary, agender, and gender variant people who don't identify as women, reading the term in text does not make those communities readily apparent. As S.A. Smythe asks in their article on Black feminism slippages with the terms feminist and woman, who's all over there in women with an X? When a term is created to encapsulate those outside or alongside the term Black women, another erasure can occur. Similarly, the phrase women and femmes has been used in social media spaces to make space for those who are not women but may find themselves hailed by the term femme, which also has contested meanings. But women and femmes doesn't quite capture all the targets of misogynoir. There are masculine of center, agender, and non-binary people who experience the deleterious effects of misogynoir and who may not identify as women or femmes, as Sakia Gunn's murder unfortunately illustrates. Similarly, not all non-binary Black femmes experience misogynoir because they are not read as Black women in public. For some femmes, homophobia and femphobia might be the lens through which they become targets of violence. Black femphobia is an important form of oppression to discuss, but it is not a synonym for misogynoir. Misogynoir is deployed because of beliefs about Black women, and those of us who are read as Black women, despite our self-identification, get caught in the crosshairs. And this is a call that I make in the text and how I want to um, end my opening remarks and, and get us into the talking more about the book itself. I challenge you, dear reader, as you read this text, to think of Black women first when you see the word woman, to think of queer and trans women first when you read the term Black women. When you read the term Black feminist, do not assume that it is interchangeable with Black women. For as this text and others I reference make clear, not all Black women are feminists and not all Black feminists are women. The projects and people I highlight in this text do not fit neatly into either category. Much like the media they create, these people are not easily slotted into a box labeled feminist or women. Many of the Black women and Black non-binary, gender, and gender variant people I discuss have dynamic relationships to the labels. They are, there are feminist elements to their work, though the work itself may not be feminist. They may have identified as a woman at some point, but not at the time I examined their work. What they all do share, however, is that they create digital media that center and uplift the experiences of Black women and girls, trans and cis, as the primary targets of misogynoir. Black women, in the title of this text, affirms Black women's centrality to the project of transforming misogynoir, even when it is not Black women or Black feminists who engage in the production of transformative media. To say the same another way, not all these Black digital alchemists are women and not all of them are feminists. Black non-binary, agender, and gender variant folks are often invisible in data collection processes, making their realities marginal within the already liminal space of Black women's digital alchemy. Nearly all of the data collected for this book 
assumed the category Black women is capacious enough to address misogynoir, but as I will detail in chapter four, Black non-binary and gender variant people are also on the front lines of the Black feminist transformation of misogynoir. As you have read in this introduction, Black women have been the central targets of misogynoir since the settling and colonization of the Americas. The Black women would then be at the heart of digital alchemist organizing in this country and beyond follows logically. But as we continue to grow our understanding of the gender binary and our digital age helps new language travel, more and more Black people are articulating themselves beyond the bounds of woman. And I will stop there and turn it over to Rollin. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much. Um, okay, now we're gonna transition into the question and the answer section. Um, I just would like to say a couple things. Um, I, I want to say that I'd, I'd like you you to sort of uh, restrict yourself to one question since we have a large group here. Uh, and please try to uh, be as efficient as possible in, in posing your question. Again, just for the sake of, of time, given the numbers that we have here. So- uh, Roland, is, Roland is saying, ask a question, don't make a comment. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I'm fine with a comment, but you know, okay. just, just being efficient <laughs> is, is important here. So you, uh, just raise your hand when you're ready to pose a question. Okay, is it uh, Shauna Leith? Yes, it's Shauna. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> um, Dr. Bailey, okay, being succinct. And so I'm in the counseling, kind of counseling psychology and education. And one thing that I've been wondering and my students have asked and our viewers have asked is kind of where does misogynoir fit in in relation to gendered racism and some of the literature on like gendered racism and black women, right? And so. I don't see the terms as interchangeable per se, but just wanting to hear from you about, you know, have you thought about that? Has that been posed to you? Is that addressed in the book? It has not There's been no addressed. I thought the the... meant talking fast. Sorry, y'all, if anyone wasn't able to hear that question. No, I heard it. I heard it. Um, no, the, uh, I do not address gendered racism in the text because I'm really trying to think through what misogynoir is doing. And as I, articulated misogynoir, I was really thinking about anti-Black misogyny. And so I wasn't thinking about gendered racism broadly. I think even when people use the term gendered racism, sometimes there's another hidden assumption in there that we're talking about Black people. And of course, for me, gendered racism includes people uh, who are experiencing racism who are not Black. And misogynoir is very specifically looking at the gendered racism that, uh, or the anti-Black racist misogyny that Black women experience and people who are read as Black women experience. So I don't spend a lot of time uh, thinking about gendered racism. And, uh, oh, I will repeat the question and really trying to get at the crux of whether gendered racism is something that was considered in the text. And I don't think that I do for, for the reasons I just mentioned, but also I think gender racism as a term or how people were thinking about it was coming alongside as misogynoir was developing. So I see them as parallel, but not the same. Great. Okay, um, Liz Alexander. Hi, Dr. Bailey. Uh, this was a great talk. Thank you so much. Uh, and I was an early CFC reader, so <clears throat> it's really exciting to see like how uh, your work has transformed since then. Um, my quick question is, uh, how do you think that uh, working in that digital space transformed this word? Um, like, you know, if, if there had been no social media, you know, in that parallel universe, how do you think that uh, the development of this word in this community would have been different? Uh, thanks. Great question. I mean, honestly, I think it would have just stayed in my dissertation and no one would know misogynoir. <laughs> I honestly think that uh, being a part of the CFC and then 
having uh, Trudy pick up the word and term of misogynoir made it accessible to a broader audience and made its significance um, more clear and apparent to people because it was happening outside of the academy. And when I think about other aspects of my intellectual work that are very much siloed and you know behind that paywall that we have in the academy, it becomes clear that social media and digital media creating work that integrates with communities beyond the academy is important. And again, I think it's something that is interesting to me is that I created the term as a graduate student and was writing about it publicly as a graduate student. And I think that's another way that it was more accessible to people. There's been an interesting revisionist history where people will say, you know, misogynoir coined by Dr. Moya Bailey. And I was not Dr. Moya Bailey when I coined the term, which is also, again, why I think it made sense for other Black women and non-binary, agender folks to pick it up because it wasn't seen as somehow belonging to the academy in a way I think it might have if I had already um, gotten my doctorate. And that loop from the dissertation to the blog, uh, it moving in a lot of digital space, then being picked up again by the academy in terms of uh, finding itself into journal articles has been a really interesting uh, circuitous route to watch uh, because I don't think that uh, the academy and outside of the academy always play very nicely together, but it has been my real, um, I don't know, and I've said this before too, that it's both a gift and a curse that people find the word so useful, like a gift in the sense that I'm, I'm glad that uh, it has been helpful to people to use, but also unfortunate that it is used so frequently. So it is a, uh, a really interesting route that social media made possible. And I don't know that it would have made, uh, I don't know that it would have been as clear if um, social media wasn't involved in its circulation. Excellent, great. Um, the next question, please. Anyone have a, a question right now? I have a question, but I'm not sure how to raise my hand on here. <laughs> uh, it's in the reactions section, but um, what? go ahead. Who, who's speaking? I'm sorry. I don't have my camera on. I'm Danny. Um, I just uh, sent uh, Dr. Mari Bailey a private message. Thank you. This really provided a lot of clarity on my battle with gender, as I already sent to you. Um, so, would you say that um, the term? Would you say that because um, you talked about how women and femme is not a good grouping because it leaves out a lot of people in their experience, their vi the violence they experience, and I totally agree. And I haven't been able to figure out how to word it, so thank you for for that clarity. Um, so, would you say then that um, saying those who experience misogynoir um, is a better grouping of words to to ex to to explain the battle with? you know, anti-Blackness and things? Oh, great question. And I, I think that we're gonna need more ways of explaining it. I think that's a wonderful frame. So like those who experience misogynoir are the people that we're trying to hail in a certain conversation, but in another conversation, we might be trying to hail, you know, people who were assigned female at birth. You know, we might be trying to hail, um, you know, people who identify as women specifically, those are the people that we're trying to 
talk about in whatever conversation or invite to uh, be a part of a conversation. So for me, I think it's very specific and that we should be as rigorous about who we're trying to call into conversation as we are about policing people who, you know, aren't using the proper terminology. I think that it it's on us to be more um, more clear about where and who we want to and understand as our uh, folks in solidarity regarding the conversation that it is that we want to have. And so I'm hopeful that uh, in articulating Sage Noir, in articulating some of the other uh, terms that people are coming up with now, we're going to get closer to uh, saying who it is that we really want to include in our conversations and in the um, spaces that we're trying to uh, use to foment uh, hopefully some really wonderful acts of solidarity and um, organizing. Thank okay. you. Thank you, fabulous. Um, the next person is uh, Bintu Diara. Hi, can you hear me? I'm sorry, yes. I didn't call. Okay, um, first of all, thank you for your work. Um, so you discussed um, the usage of the term misogynoir and all that it kind of like encapsulates when it comes to those affected. In the book, do you ever get into why certain groups of Black women are left out? And can you say why certain Black women are left out? Do you, can you say what you mean? Like who do you imagine? Like why because? historically, um, when we think about Black womanhood, why we exclude trans Black women, queer Black women, um, things like that? Oh, yes, yes. Thank you for that question. So the question was trying to figure out why certain Black women have been traditionally excluded from the term Black women. And so, yes, I do talk a bit about historically thinking about the relative recent uh, language that we have to describe sexuality and gender. You know, we have, even the language of trans is relatively new in terms of how we understand gender, even though trans people, of course, have been throughout history, throughout cultures. But that language is also new. And I'd also add that it's new to uh, talk about people in relationship to their sexual identity and their gender identity. This is also, I think, a product of the West in some ways that those uh, habits, behaviors have cohered as identities. And that isn't true all the time everywhere. Uh, one of my favorite um, scholars is Gloria Lecker and her work about um, the practice of Mati work in Suriname really expands and opens this idea of, you know, queer sexual behavior, not as an identity, but as a practice. So uh, women have sexual relationships, romantic relationships with each other, not an identity, but definitely a practice, definitely something that people participate in. Uh, but the idea of identity uh, I think as the way we understand sexuality and gender is, you know, in the last hundred years or so in terms of human existence. So historically, organizing Black women in a way that includes or addresses queer women isn't always a deliberate uh, act of neglect but also has to do with that not being the terms or the way that people were understanding themselves uh, at the time. And there are really beautiful 
histories, which I wish we had more of publicly of, you know, black queer women and men's relationships um, post-slavery in the Americas and those relationships being valued and treated, you know, positively in their communities. Um, but again, those things sort of slip our um, understanding because they don't fit a dominant narrative. So I would say uh, to the question, one reason is that the language is new and two, uh, we have to do a better job of telling the stories and finding the narratives where, where people are and how people are describing and understanding themselves to bring that, to bring that history to light. Okay, uh, Talik Tillman. Um, just thank you eternally um, for your words and your time and energy. Um, and my question is for like in your own experience when engaging with people outside of the academy who might not have the terminology or the lexicon or no kind of detailed histories. Um, I just am wondering um, how um, you work with rather than working for or um, against um, people who might not have the same developed understanding of these histories as you. Um, yeah, great question. So I would say, it's plain. Um, I would say that one of the ways that I think I try to break down that barrier of people not having access to certain terminology is to define my terms when possible. And then also to show that the terms themselves um, do some important work. Like I think naming misogynoir was important, but I definitely see it in a legacy of things that Black women have already named for themselves. So I talk about misogynoir as having a history related to uh, concepts that were developed in the writing of the Kambahi River Collective uh, connected to concepts and theories that were attributed to Sojourner Truth speeches. There is a legacy of addressing misogynoir by Black women in all but name that predates my coining of the term. And I think that's true of intersectionality. I think that that is definitely a, uh, a legacy that I hope people can come to understand the word in a definite conversation with. And I would also invite people to use and understand their own experiences as an important site for understanding a lot of the concepts that I'm bringing up. Uh, one of the examples of this that I really like that comes from people who do prison abolition work and transformative justice work is they give the example of being at a party and uh, having a friend who wants to, who's been drinking too much and wants to drive away. And like you making the decision to grab their keys and not call the police. That's an act of everyday abolition. You know, you're not going to allow your friend to drive drunk um, that little act of resistance is abolition, even if people don't use that term or maybe understand all of the nuances that people are trying to get to when they talk about prison abolition, defunding the police, etc. So I think there are other examples like that of everyday people's experiences that explores and shows how misogynoir has impacted their lives, whether they have access to that term term or not. Okay, uh, I believe uh, Jorge has a question. Is he there? Wait, he, he wrote in. Let me see. 
Um, maybe we'll return to that later. Is there anyone else with a raised hand that wants to? Oh, sorry, my mic was off, sorry. Oh, okay. okay there it is. Sorry about that. Thank you, Dr. Bailey, for the discussion. Um, my question is, have you faced opposition from trans exclusionary radical feminists for including black trans women in the misogynoir definition and discussion? And how do you navigate this? Oh, that's a great question. I have been very fortunate not to have to deal with too many TERFs, <laughs> given my own uh, expression and orientation. So the question to repeat it um, is, have I had to deal with trans exclusionary radical feminists uh, resistance to trans women being included in my term of misogynoir. And I would say I haven't had to deal with that too much, especially since I'm really clear that, you know, trans women are women. So it's like not even, I feel like it's not even a question because women are women. And also <laughs> part of the, um, one of the one of the real gifts of the book for me and how it actually evolved and emerged was in being connected to Janet Mock on Twitter very early in uh, when Twitter when I would say Twitter was just a wasteland <laughs> when there were like maybe you know a hundred or so people that I talked to regularly on Twitter. Uh, when it was so small and nascent. So that relationship informed how I was thinking about misogynoir from the very beginning. And uh, chapter two goes very specifically into Janet Mock's use of the hashtag girls like us. So it's been pretty central to um, the project from inception. And I was, I was very fortunate to have um, Janet do a blurb for the book. So I feel like it's very clear to TERFs that misogynoir is not a term that they should be using if they think that trans women are not women. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll, I'll actually jump in here and ask a last question. I think we're getting fairly close to time. Um, I, you know, I was intrigued in the book uh, by your suggestion that these, um, these social media platforms allow, uh, allow these participants to create sort of alternative public spheres for themselves that protect them, uh, that nurture them in the face of these sort of uh, mis misogynoir attacks, right? Um, and one of the things I was I found striking about that is right that this is a a form of public sphere being created through digital media, and you you point out on a couple of occasions that you know you compare that to earlier forms of public sphere, say uh, uh, black women club movements uh, at the in the at the turn of the century and so forth. Uh, one of the things I'm wondering if you could elaborate on is um, you know what does it mean to sort of how, how is it different to find, found a public sphere through digital means as opposed to the sort of print media public sphere of the middle class, you know, at the turn of the century, right? It's print media that, that ushers in that or makes that public sphere possible. So this is two, two, two different mediums sort of establishing it. What are, what are the politics of that shift in your mind? Oh, great question, Roland. Um, Roland, um, one of the things I've been thinking about, and the question was, you know, how does the print medium uh, of these earlier social media conversations compare to this digital moment and how digital media is uh, perhaps enabling conversations in this moment? Um, and what I would say is, there is a real shift in who has access to the conversation because of the medium. So I've noticed something I talk about in this book 
and in my book, Hashtag Activism, uh, co-authored with Sarah J. Jackson and Brooke Foucault Wells, is that there is a difference between Facebook and Twitter and TikTok and Instagram in terms of demographics. So the kinds of conversations that people are having on all of those different platforms varies because of the age and um, class position and means by which people are accessing these tools. All of that shifts uh, how these things come across. So I would say that even as I'm looking at uh, Twitter and looking at how people have used uh, Facebook or Instagram, YouTube, it's constantly shifting because uh, people are aging out of certain sites or you know, entering the social media platform stage and saying Facebook is for old people. I don't wanna be on that, on that particular site. So to me, it's, it's definitely shaping the way conversations are had and that has even shifted on these different platforms over time. I don't think that um, the connections that I made with Janet Mock in my early Twitter days would have been possible now because of how the platform has shifted, how people have become brands. Even the language of followers is very interesting to have developed this idea of influencers uh, part of the book is a little bit of a love letter to those early digital uh, media days of Blogger and LiveJournal and Tumblr, where I felt like people actually read people's work and were in conversation with each other. I'm working on a misogynoir transformed podcast where I'm interviewing some of the people who really influenced and shaped the book. And one of the things that they have said to me was that, um, or Maya Williams, who is one of these early adopters of these platforms who's been really influential, was to say that it was like writing letters, like a bit like a pen pal exchange uh, in those early digital days, and that social media is not that anymore. And I would agree with that. I think we have shifted and moved into a different era. And unfortunately, it doesn't, it doesn't look the same. Oh, you're, you're on mute. We've got uh, maybe time for one quick one. Um, Michelle is next. Hi, Dr. Bailey. This is Michelle Ferrier. Good to see you again. It's been a couple of years. Yes. Um, I wanted to speak specifically about the technologies and the platforms and wondering whether you and uh, your partners have talked to the media platforms themselves regarding some of the violence through algorithms and the ways in which those platforms are uh, shuttering the accounts of uh, Black activists online who are performing using these technologies. So what are some, um, have you had those conversations and what are some of the strategies that we might employ when the platforms aren't listening to us in our efforts to uh, change the algorithmic um, violence? Thank you so much for that question. And uh, the question is trying to get at have I talked to um, some of the platform creators and what do we do with the fact that these platforms often enact their own misogynoir by keeping us from utilizing the platforms by banning us? And uh, Danielle Cole, who is, who is here, has experienced this. And talks, I talk about that in chapter four in an interview with them about that very thing. What happens when we are trying to use platforms, but the platforms themselves are enacting um, some of this violence. So one suggestion is that we need new platforms. So even as we are using the tools that are given to us, I think another thing that we need is to create our own tools. 
And then also pushing back more on the platforms themselves to say, these are the things we need. I've been in conversation with a couple of platforms and unfortunately, because they are so big, their idea of serving the user is not very uh, advanced because you know we are also the thing being offered up to the advertisers uh, with our content. So for that to shift, I think we need a different idea of what the terms of service are that we agree to with these platforms. And that, that's gonna take a bit more time for us to make those interventions. Great, thank you. Sorry, I'm sorry. I think we're sort of running up on time here. Uh, so I would just like once again to thank uh, Professor Bailey for uh, being with us today and for her wonderful work. Uh, if you can join me all in uh, giving her a, a, a resounding clap with your uh, reactions here. Um, and that will, uh, that will conclude our, our session for today. Thank you all so much for, for, for joining us today. And it's been a wonderful uh, inaugural event for this reading series. So thank you all. <laughs>